we need to have a, a broader, more global, more impartial, uh, less speciesist ethical approach. And then if we use our intelligence and our technologies and our abilities, uh, I think we can get to a, a better world that isn't imperiled like the one we're living on now is. Professor Peter Singer is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by Innovators Magazine and 1.5 Media. Peter was born in Melbourne, Australia in 1946 and educated at the University of Melbourne and the University of Oxford. After teaching in England, the United States, and Australia, he has since 1999 been IR. Ira W. DeCamp Professor of Bioethics in the University Center for Human Values at Princeton University. He first became well known internationally after the publication of Animal Liberation in 1975. In 2011, Time included Animal Liberation on its all time list of the 100 best nonfiction books published in English since the magazine began in 1923. He has written, co-authored, edited, or co-edited more than 50 books, which have been translated into more than 30 languages. His books include Practical Ethics and ex The Expanding Circle, How Are We to Live? Rethinking Life and Death, Ethics in the Real World, Why Vegan, and most recently, he has edited a new edition of what may be the world's earliest surviving novel, The Golden Ass, by Apuleius, and I might be saying that wrong. Am I saying that wrong, Peter? Uh, Apuleius. Is Apuleius. You, you went far out. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Peter's book, The Life You Can Save, first published in 2009, led him to found a nonprofit organization of the same name, which has raised more than 35 million US dollars for the most effective charities assisting people in extreme poverty. In 2012, he was made a companion of the Order of Australia, the nation's highest civic honor. Since 2021, he has been a co-editor of the Journal of the Conver Controversial Ideas, which enables authors to publish well-argued controversial essays in a peer-reviewed journal under a pseudonym. He also has a wonderful course, a massively open online course titled Effective Altruism, which uh, he teaches for free. It's offered for free, as far as I, I still recall, and um, it is a wonderful course. Welcome to the show, Peter. I'm so glad that you can make it. It's late in the evening in Australia, and I'm glad you could take the time to spend and talk with us. I'm glad I could too, Mac. It's uh, good to get a chance to chat with you and uh, indirectly to all your viewers and listeners. So with your, with your long bio, the, the amount of books you've read uh, as a professor, the teachings you've done uh, in ethics and, 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 and many other uh, what could be controversial things, we've just experienced the craziest time. We're still kind of at the tail end of, of a crazy time of pandemic, Black Lives Matters, Asian racism, uh, California burning, uh, Australia burning, uh, I could go on and on, floods, droughts, uh, issues around climate change going around the world. And this 45 years or more that you've been working and writing and talking and thinking about ways and models to live a better life, to treat other species better, to... Um, What's the purpose and, and, and kind of where are we going on this wonderful journey? How have, one, I genuinely want to know, how have you weathered this crazy time? Did you make it through uh, the pandemic? Uh, are, are you okay? And second, has there been any kind of learning wisdoms, aha moments that have come out and say, wow, 
all this work and this what I've been discussing and teaching has really proven to be a better, more resilient model for life to, to get you through the hard times, to know where to go or how to help others put you in a unique place. And so I kind of want to see both sides. One, how, how are you and your wife and, and how have you weathered? And, and secondly, are there, were there some learning lessons? Are there some learning lessons in all of this craziness uh, for better life? Yes, yeah, sure. So firstly, uh, my wife and I and the other immediate family, children and grandchildren have uh, all come through this okay. Um, we've spent this time in Australia, which has had uh, very strict lockdown policies. In fact, we're under lockdown here in Melbourne right now. Um, that means for the last two weeks and for at least another week or two, uh, we're not supposed to go more than five kilometers from our home. We're not supposed to have any visitors in our home, only go out for an hour a day exercise or shopping for essential food. Uh, it's, it's pretty restricted, but that has kept the virus down. Um, we hope it will continue to, but you know we can't really be confident that we are at the end of this yet because there's new variants are possible and some of them might eventually evade the vaccines. Uh, which so far have done a very good job, I think, but it's not over. Um, but perhaps the more interesting question is, you know, what are the lessons? Has it shown that anything that I've said has been relevant to trying to get out of this situation or better still not get into them in future? And the answer to that is yes. In fact, you know, a few years ago in, in uh, something that I wrote about, about food, uh, I did point out that factory farming is a way of producing viruses. You know, you, you take 20,000 chickens, for example, you crowd them into a single shed. Um, they're stressed from the overcrowding. And of course, if viruses get into one of those birds, they'll get into all of them and they will mutate as they go through the flock. And so they may change and they may become more transferable to humans. And then you have human handlers coming in to basically pick them up and throw them into crates or something to be trucked off for slaughter. So they can easily pick up the viruses. And viruses have arisen in this way. The uh, swine flu pandemic of 2009 came out of a factory farm. Uh, I'm not saying that the coronavirus uh, that we're experiencing at the moment did, but certainly it seems to have come from animals. And the more contact we have with animals in terms of rearing them for food, uh, capturing wild animals, um, re removing the habitat, the, the biodiversity, so that animals are closer to us and come to invade our properties more. Uh, all of those things create risks. And we would do better if we produce less meat or ideally no meat and uh, didn't have the same risk. You know, we have a much reduced risk of pandemics. I totally agree. And there, there, um, uh just as you mentioned, there were definitely some learning lessons during this time. So uh, Tyson's Cargill and some other meat producers in the United States had had some real issues here in Germany, where I'm at, uh, had some major issues around meat production and chicken and, and uh, beef production were huge issues where a lot of people who were the workers in the conditions were getting sick because of the working conditions, but also because um, just the extreme stress and, and, and way that the, the food is pro produced um, was creating some pretty big issues. And there was many times, not only because of panic where the shelves products were emptied in the grocery store, but that there were empty grocery store shelves because the products needed to be recalled because of issues in the slaughter and the production and the processing of those of those products that something went wrong or um, some issues came in there. So yeah, I, I totally see that. Yeah, that, that happens quite frequently and uh, the conditions of workers in these places are really bad as well. Um, uh, I think it's just an awful system. Uh, if, uh, you know, I haven't even started talking about the animals, which I'm sure we will get onto, yeah, um, or the impact on climate change. But uh, uh, it's really something that needs to change and, and needs to change as fast as it can. Um, 
I, I, I guess we I really want to start first uh, with, with some of the teasings of, of what you're, you're, you are working uh, nonstop, uh, ceaselessly, and really doing a lot, lot of things out there. But you've been an influence for such a long time. Matter of fact, to have a new book, a cookbook from Jane Goodall, Eat uh, Meat Less here. And she she kind of worked on this together with her J Jane Goodall uh, Institute as well, but wrote the foreword. But she says she read your book 45 years ago and um, it, it changed her life. And she's been vegan since and um, doesn't regret it. And, and when she's asked kind of how did that come about she said it, it was really about the way you presented it in the stories and her work with animals um not just as an animal lover but in, in the things that she saw uh in her work that is so true how we're experimenting on animals and and since i've met dozens of people who have read your books and uh, said i really changed my view on food and on animal agriculture and how we experiment on animals and it's it's had a profound impact on my life and so uh, it, it's truly an honor to have you here on the show to have just a real um, discussion with you my question is is there's now this emergence of some new options or we hear the buzzwords about lab-grown meat and 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 um new types of plant-based alternatives for, for meat. How do you feel about, uh, just right out of the shoot, I ask you the hard question, how do you feel about lab-based meat, cellular agriculture? Do you think that's a, a, another kind of Frankenstein or is that an option that could be a, a, a hope for humanity and, and animals? Uh, I think it's an option. I think it's a good option. It's good that it'd be available for people who want meat. I don't imagine that I'm going to be uh, wanting to eat much of it. Uh, but, um, you know, I have been on a plant-based diet for such a long time now. Uh, but the point is that, that there are some people who just haven't made the shift. In fact, the majority of people obviously have still not made the shift. And yet we need them to make the shift because it's as we were saying, it's, it's bad for the planet. It's bad for the animals, it's bad for us in terms of our, our health, both individual health from what we're eating and the greater risk of pandemics. So the sooner it changes, the better. And if there are people who just, you know, like the taste and feel in their mouth of uh, a burger or a steak or whatever else it might be, a piece of chicken, uh, and we can produce that in the lab, or let's say in a factory, it's not going to be in a lab for long, obviously. Um, but if we can do that, and if we can sell it to them at a price that they'll accept that's competitive with the meat product, it's going to be a huge benefit for the planet and for animals. So yeah, I'm all in favor of that. Um, I don't think you're going to see it on the supermarket shelves with a label lab grown meat. Um, I think they'll come up with something, you know, maybe cultured meat, uh, like we have cultured dairy products, um, that might be a possibility. Uh, various labels, people are talking about clean meat because it's not infected by bacteria in the way that meat from animals often is. But, you know, they'll, they'll find a label. But uh, yes, it will be meat that was originally, I guess, designed in a lab, but then uh, once they got the basic idea of how to do it, they're growing it on a large scale in, in factories. Yeah, and let's hope we can keep that within our planetary boundaries and in a sustainable way with not a lot of extra preservatives and aromas and flavors and high processing so that it's uh, still a, a good product. And I'm, I'm glad to know that because I, um, I've seen a big shift in vegetarians and vegans as, as well, where they're very accepting of, of a new option. I've also run into the simple fact of what, what you just you just mentioned is that those people who have been vegan uh, for a long time who have tried, for example, the Impossible Burger, they said, oh, that tastes too much like meat. I don't like that taste. That That's an enzyme or a, a, a taste bud that I guess I no longer have a desire for. 
and it's it's interesting how our taste buds and our what what we crave actually changes over time uh i myself have gone through that numerous times in my life and, and where it's like yeah that's I might as well eat cardboard it that doesn't taste like anything to me or you know i, I love enjoy the rich flavor of plants and, and other things so i've got your other two books here animal liberation um this is the uk version and why mm -hmm. vegan is also the uk version you have the american copies there uh in front of you i do so yeah can, that's right so um, show our guests good so this is the edition of animal liberation that if you're in the united states or canada you're most likely to pick up uh it's a harper perennial classic edition um and why vegan was published uh the edition you've got is a penguin one in the us it's it's published by norton and it, it looks quite different in fact it's it's a small hardback at the moment but uh i think will wow. be coming out in paperback uh the, but yeah the content is is pretty much the same actually one nice thing about your uk edition of animal liberation is it has a forward by yuval harari the author of yeah. sapiens um yeah. and sorry americans you're you're not getting that with this edition um, yeah, I really love Yuval and, and his work and, and uh, his writings, and he really gave you a nice uh, view. The reason why we are putting up these books to tell that there, there's, there's a couple reasons. One, so that wherever you're in the world, you can know what issue to get to read in English. It's, they are available in other languages avail as well from, from other outlets and sources. You have done over 50 different books, but I mean, obviously there's some that are, are more um, well known to others, but there's another reason. So recently with the Brexit and some issues with the U European Union, publishing houses are a little bit different. And so if you're like me, an American living in Germany, trying to get English books, you either get them from the United States or the United Kingdom. But now because of Brexit and the EU restrictions, there's a new importing tax. And so it's a whole craziness to get books nowadays. That's why I love that your books are always on Audible um, to, to get that way as well. You can get them in ebook versions. Uh, and and th there's some other new things. The way our world is kind of becoming more uh, nationalistic and more divided, not as global uh, as we were in some respects, can be good and bad, and uh, even in education in some respects. And so there's uh, some things to take into account. The um, Why Vegan is a little bit newer and mm -hmm. uh, has a lot of similar content to this, but I want to, I want to go through a, a couple things. One, why vegan kind of give us a synopsis of why this came out. Is it just an easier read uh, to keep the capture the, the audience who's kind of on the elevator pitch, the Ted talks, the short version, uh, the nitty gritty of things. Why did you come out with this one? Um, and, and is it addressing a whole nother market? Yeah, it is really. I mean, the suggestion for that, did come from Penguin because they were the original publisher. And if you look at the back of that copy that you've got, it's part of this great ideas series. Um, yeah, that's right. So people can see there right at the top. So it's, they've, they've published a series of books of great ideas, um, starting off with uh, Aristotle, I think, on that one, and you know, certainly going right back to the Greeks and a lot of people, really interesting thinkers. And uh, they asked me if I wanted to be the end of it. I think I'm the only thinker on that list that is who is still alive, um, a distinction I hope to retain for a while. Uh, but um, uh, so I was I was honored to be part of it. And I thought, yes, this is a good way to get some more exposure to my ideas, to people who are going to pick up this, uh, you know, small, not very expensive book. I uh, think, yeah, I can read that in an hour or two. I'll pick up the gist of what Singer is talking about with regard to animals and food. Uh, and, and that was the idea to get some of this stuff out. As you say, there's overlap with animal liberation. There's um, uh, an extract from animal liberation in it uh, from, the, from the preface. Um, but, uh, but there's a lot of newer stuff as well that uh, they, people would not have seen otherwise. 
So it was, it was just a, a, that sort of marketing opportunity. And then when Penguin were doing it and Penguin didn't actually, wasn't planning to publish the whole series in the US. Uh, so Norton then said, um, okay, we're, we'll be happy to pick that up as a, as a single volume in the US. That's beautiful. And, and uh, going back to animal liberation, um, we've seen a few editions come out, but you've teased me and let me know that uh, it's really time for another revision of animal li liberation. And even though I, I thought with Yuval Noah Harari's uh, kind of foreword or, or, or preface in, in this that uh, it was amazing. It couldn't get any better uh, over the years. You, you have made some little bit of fine tuning and kind of added some things that maybe were missing. Can you tease a little bit what we have to look forward to? And, um, uh, and then I, I really want to also get into the gist of your style because you have a very uh, distinct style that the way you talk about ethics and liberation and species and how we use certain terminology and words like animals. Mm -hmm. Sure. Let me tell you uh, firstly a little bit about the additions. So, um, you know, what you've got there and, and, and this one that I held up here uh, are updated, you know, it's, it's actually, this says updated edition, but, um, but, but the updating is not really a complete overhaul. There were some facts and figures improved, uh, updated. There was a new uh, preface that I wrote, as well as Yuval Harari's forward. Um, and there was a little bit of extra material at the end. But the basic text of this book um, really was written in 1990. There were, you know, the first edition was 1975. I did do a very thorough revision in 1990. Um, but these subsequent editions were not as thorough as that one. So um, there's a lot of things that just aren't in it. Um, for example, I don't talk about climate change. And if you're talking about uh, becoming vegetarian or vegan nowadays, even, even though this is a book about animal liberation, it's still important to point out that, you know, yes, we, we really need to do this to save the whole planet as well. Uh, then another thing you just mentioned, in fact, the cellular agriculture is not talked about in this book. Um, and that's, that's an, another option. But um, even more important, perhaps, you know, if people read, so there's a chapter on the use of animals in experiments in, in scientific research. And people could, could read that book and say, well, look, all of these experiments are getting pretty dated now. You, know, you, you won't find in that edition you've got, or, or in this one, um, an experiment from the 1990s, let alone from the 21st century. And so people might say, oh, you know, Singer's writing about the bad old days. Um, and since then, we know that there've been improvements. Uh, well, uh, I, I actually thought when I began writing this book that there, there were a lot of significant improvements and uh, that I wouldn't be able to find really nasty experiments of the sort that I had found without any trouble, unfortunately. Um, both for the 75 edition and for the 1990 edition. But um, as I've been doing the research, it turns out that's not the case, unfortunately. There are still quite a lot of really, really cruel and painful experiments done on animals. And they're not experiments that are you know, going to provide cures for cancer or the coronavirus or things like that. They're, they're really very far away from that and you know one of the things that i quote is quite often people try to produce these animal models of depression for example or of um, ptsd um, by and, and to do that they have to cause you know misery to animals to make them depressed artificially or to make them suffer post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome um, and uh and then they admit after doing this for many animals for a few years they say oh well this model isn't quite right um, you know, it doesn't produce the right, something that parallels human beings. So we need to change it and do something different. Um, and that's, that's just gone on. You know, I, I, can, I, I can now, when I produce this new edition in a year or two, I'll be able to say, this has been going on for 60 or 70 years. Some of these lines of research trying to produce these models of depression, um, 
something, there was something called learned helplessness that was produced by giving animals inescapable electric shock. That was supposed to model depression. It goes back to the, to the 1950s and 1960s. So it's, it's, a, it's a, not a pleasant story, but I needed to bring that story up to date so that people didn't think, yeah, you know, that happened then, but it, it doesn't happen now. I myself have been talking about food for quite some time. Um, I'm, I'm 51 this year in October, um, but I see food as our basic energy source. So uh, a, ca a caloric unit as a measurement of energy. I don't want anybody to count calories. Please don't misinterpret me, but it's, uh, it's a measurement of energy and it's a, uh, if, if you believe in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you believe in uh, regulating your body temperature, uh, breathing food and water are, are, are the ways that we regulate our body temperature and give it, ourselves energy. Uh, and it's through food. And I feel that food is the tie, um, not only to the basic physiological needs of humanity, but it's also the tie of poverty and suffering and malnutrition and hunger and all the things that you also address and and some of the other books that we'll touch upon as 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 well and other your other writings but that it's not only the biggest effect on human suffering and human health but it's also the biggest effect on global warming and uh, climate change and environmental destruction, ecological destruction, biodiversity loss, on and on. But on the flip side, if we get it right, if we can figure out how to get food right, it's also the biggest opportunity that we ever have to not only do something that's enjoyable and wonderful to do three times a day with our family, friends, uh, but also to, to fix the planet, fix our environment, to, to be part of this uh, symbiotic earth. And so I, I've been reading and studying about it a lot. This is one of Vaclav Smil's books. Have you ever heard of oh, Vaclav yes, Smil? Yes, I know his work. Well, Absolutely, yes. yes. Sh yeah. Should we eat meat? And uh, which is kind of unique because Vaclav Smil writes about energy and grand transformations. And he... He, um, when, when I read his book on growth or civilization and energy, uh, um, I was so surprised that more than half of the book, which is a biblical in proportion and size, was all about agriculture. It was all about food. And I'm like, this is a book mm -hmm. about energy and civilization. Why is it so much about food? And um, so when I first read Animal Liberation and I've read your other writings, I was like a no brainer that it's so much tied to a lot of the solutions, a lot of the problems to our woes as humanity are tied to, to food and how we interact and produce food and, and make food. And um, I, I just, when you were mentioning that, I just wanted to, to kind of bring that up, how you for for many of us, I believe, are, are connecting the dots on on why we do things, how we should do things, what are the ethics behind things, and what's the direction we're taking here? Is that's kind of what I get out of your readings and your teachings as well? That that there is uh, two sides to the coin. There's two sides to how we can do it right, or uh, as a symbiotic planet and, and not. And so. Um, I guess that you continually update and give us, you know, the newest information in your books and make sure we have the right data that we're talking about climate change and um, how, the, how these things impact. For many years, humanity, but also myself, I was led to believe that the oil, coal, and gas, the fossil fuel industry, the automotive industry, the telco industry was the biggest cause of human suffering and greenhouse gas emissions and climate change. And that's absolutely not true. They're on the list. They're like maybe eight, nine, or 10 on the list of the top 10. But food is right there up at the top in multiple sectors on the biggest contributors to, to human suffering, health, malnutrition, poverty, et cetera, and, and, and environmental 
and ecological destruction. And so um, that you bring that now into your new, to, to the new updated version that you're, you're revising and going to come out with animal liberation is, is a no brainer for me. But you said earlier that you write a lot about food. Why, mm. why is that? And how have you started to, to make these connections and to let people know that there's a big connection? Well, I think you've, you've put it well. Um, and you know, you, you held up the book by Vaclav Smil and I, in one of his earlier books, I think he said something like to, for the whole planet, for the whole population of the world to eat as much meat as we eat in Western countries, you would need three planets, not one. So, you know, we're, we're clearly perpetuating a system that in its nature is, is unequal um, because the rest of the world couldn't possibly eat as much meat as we could. The world couldn't produce it and, and couldn't survive. None of nature would survive. The oceans wouldn't survive if we were to try to do that. Uh, so there's a, if you like, a, a basic unfairness. Um, but there's also all of those other ramifications. Uh, I came to food initially with animal liberation uh, through my concern for animals and the suffering of animals I wanted to contribute to preventing. And that's why I became a, a vegetarian back in 1970. I've just you know, passed uh, 50, 50 years of being a vegetarian now uh, at a time when it was pretty strange still, you know, we were living in England at the time and the, the, the best vegetarian restaurant in London was called Cranks. And I think that was sort of self-mocking, but that was, that was how people thought of vegetarian. Oh, you're Cranks. Um, so, you know, things have, things have changed a lot over then. There are far more vegetarians. It's far more accepted. You don't have to go to specialist vegetarian restaurants in order to get a vegetarian meal like you used to. Uh, so there's a huge amount of change. But um, with that have come all of these other reasons that you mentioned, the fact that uh, ag you know, agriculture and particularly animal agriculture is, is devastating the planet, is polluting local environments, is polluting rivers. We're growing huge quantities of grain just in order to feed them to animals, which waste something like 70 to 80% of the food value of the grain that we're putting into the animals. So if we, if we cut out the meat, we could eat much more lightly on the, on the planet because we wouldn't need to grow all that grain and, and feed it to animals and waste most of it. Uh, and, and there's the climate change factors and we've already mentioned the, uh, the, the virus related factors, which is only one of the health aspects actually. What we haven't mentioned is the fact that animals are routinely fed antibiotics, uh, factory farm animals, and that that means that the bacteria become resistant to antibiotics and we're having increasing problems with multiply resistant bacteria that lead to very serious illness and, and sometimes death uh, because we've lost the antibiotics that used to kill these bacteria. So there's a, there's a whole range of problems. And, uh, you know, I, I certainly would like to say to people and uh, Jane Goodall would as well, I know you held up her book, that, um, you know, you can really live a, a great life. You can enjoy eating, you can feel fit and healthy. Uh, you can be uh, long-lived and vigorous as uh, Jane is and as I hope to go on being um, uh, for uh, uh, you know, a, a, a terrific life uh, without, meeting it, without eating meat at all. Um, and, but even if people just sort of cut down their meat and you know, regard it as something they eat once or twice a week rather than seven days a week, um, that would already make a huge difference to the planet. So, so yeah, I, I like the way you presented the sort of the double-sided nature of it. There's a lot of really bad things we're doing to the planet, to ourselves, to animals, but it's an opportunity. It's, it's one of the easiest ways in a way in which we could take 15% out of the greenhouse gas emissions that are going into the atmosphere right now without, without sacrificing anything, without, with, really with benefiting ourselves, um, which is, you know, much better than some of the things we think about, oh, how are we going to cope without flying or how are we going to cope without air conditioning and you know, keep some energy. But, but this is one that's, that's really a win-win a, a for everyone. So I'm, I, I've debated long and hard um, preparing for our, our conversation, kind of how I would try to take the, the flow through. I, I have some, some questions or some things that um, 
not even necessarily questions, some things I'd like to discuss that came up in, in animal liberation that I'd like to go deeper in or maybe uncover if that's okay. And so I was thinking we would, yeah. we would go through animal liberation on a couple of those, those, uh, those thoughts or those questions that arise for me first. And then, um, then when we're done with that, we will probably head down a couple rabbit holes and get into a lot deeper conversation. Then I want to kind of circle back around to some of the, the books that I, I, I touched upon in, in your biography and when I introduce you and, and go into those because those are open up a whole nother world of things uh, um, that, that I want to touch in as we kind of close out our discussion today. Um, when when I was younger, a matter of fact, I believe I was in junior high school, I read the book, The Jung Jungle, and mm -hmm. uh, horrific, Sinclair, yeah, yeah her horrific uh, thing. And um, there are other books like that and like Animal Liberation done in a little bit different way um, that are also historical books, I guess, um, out there on eating meat or um, on uh, not just on liberation, but on how we treat our workers, how we treat children, how we treat other animals and species that were an animal in, in and of itself. And that just started to, uh, at a young age for me, um, which is unheard of because I, I, I studied in the United States and I think it's probably one of the worst education systems in our world and education needs to be improved, but um, that I even was came across that book and had, had a good teacher that, that that got us to, to start thinking in that way. Another book um, is, and I don't know if you've heard of it, is The Bloodless Revolution from Tristram uh, mm. uh, uh, Stewart. Stewart. Yeah. yeah, Tristram Stewart, The Bloodless mm. Revolution. And it kind of talks about the history of vegetarian, uh, veganism uh, without, without meat. And he's a big proponent as well on that kind of giving us the long history of that. But no matter whether it's Yuval Noah Harari, whether it's you or that, this long history of, of humans with food ha has a big impact on, on how our climate, on how human health, how suffering, how civilization collapse can occur, depending on how well we get the our infrastructure of food, right? So my my real question is: Was there something that inspired you before you read Animal Liberation, a historical book like that, or was it through big history learning where you're like saying food and and, and this ties into it, or was it a little bit of a different journey? Uh, no, it wasn't any particular. Well, there wasn't actually an influential book, but it was not a famous book. Um, but but before that, there was a really important meeting for me. I was uh, I was a graduate student at Oxford in 1970. Um, I'd gone there from Australia to do my graduate studies. It was like the center of the philosophical universe. So it seemed to me at the time coming from Australia. Um, and uh, I happened to meet at a class, a Canadian graduate student who I'd never at before, but he, you know, he liked one of the questions I asked and he wanted to talk about it. So he went for lunch at his college, um, just talking about the, the, the philosophy thing, which had nothing to do with animals or food. But um, when we came into lunch, there was a choice of just two things you could, you could eat for lunch at the college. There was a hot dish, which was spaghetti with a sauce on top of it, or there was a cold salad plate. Um, so I automatically took the spaghetti because I wanted the more substantial hot meal rather than just salad. But uh, Richard, my um, companion, asked whether there was meat in the sauce. And when there was told he, uh, when he was told that he, there was meat in the sauce, he took the salad plate. So I noticed that at the time because that was really unusual. You just didn't meet vegetarians. You know why? What was his problem about meat? I thought. Um, he didn't seem to be a Hindu. Uh, he was a Canadian, not of uh, you know, Indian <laughs> background or anything. Um, why else would he be you know, avoiding meat? Um, so, you know, when, when we'd finished our conversation about free will and determinism or whatever it was, um, uh, I asked him what his problem with meat was. Um, 
and I expected some sort of, I think I expected like, you know, either some kind of mystical views about the oneness of everything or um, perhaps a kind of absolute pacifism that killing is always wrong, including even if you are fighting Hitler's Germany, which I would not have believed. Um, uh, but he didn't come out with anything like that. He came out with something much simpler, which was, I don't think it's right to treat the animals the way that the animal that was on your plate or whose flesh was on your plate was treated. Um, and that surprised me because I thought animals had good lives before they were killed. You know, I thought they were all out in the fields. And, you know, of course I knew that they got killed and uh, driving on country roads, inevitably you see a truck full of animals on their way to slaughter. They don't look very happy, but, um, but I thought that was all there was to it. But, but uh, you know, Richard said, no, you know, increasingly they're being brought inside um, in, in sort of sheds and they're very crowded and their lives are pretty miserable all the way along. Uh, and I said, really, is that, is that true? And he said, yeah, there's, there's a book you can read about it. And the book was one called uh, Animal Machines by Ruth Harrison, which was not a book that I'd heard of, not a book that many people had heard of. It, it had been published a few years earlier, but it hadn't had a lot of publicity or, or big sales or anything. But it did describe quite factually and often with quotes from farming trade journals, uh, the way in which animals were being reared. And uh, she had one line that really struck. She said, cruelty is acknowledged only where profitability ceases. So in other words, farmers will do anything to an animal that remains profitable. And only if it, the animal starts getting so badly treated that it dies, let's say, and you can't sell it, um, then will the fact that they're overcrowded start to be thought about. Uh, and that's a, a really very low standard because in fact, with some kinds of animal rearing, if, if most of them are doing okay and putting on weight, the fact that some of them die or more of them die because they're so crowded, you might still make more money than you would if you gave them a bit more space. So um, I looked into that and I decided I couldn't really justify it. I couldn't defend treating animals that way. Um, you know, I knew that they suffered um, and why should you inflict suffering on them just so that we can get meat or eggs or, uh, a bit cheaper. Um, so that's when I started looking more deeply into that whole topic and, and became a vegetarian. Um, so yes, you know, there was a book, but it was not a, it was not a famous book. It was really a, a person and, and his example, the fact that he'd become a vegetarian some years earlier for similar reasons that had this effect on me and then i've been able to affect jane goodall and many others so it's You've it's many, a chain that goes on yeah. yeah and I, I i really appreciate that that you have taken that stance and not only as a a, a human but uh um professor you've taught many people in, in many areas to look at the world a little bit differently and think about ethics and ask ask certain questions there um uh, and you you can obviously tell that I'm a book lover and a book hound. I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Hannah Arndt. No, oh, yes, I, the, I read Hannah Arendt when I was an undergraduate, actually. Yeah, the yeah. the she was, human she was very, condition and then yeah. the Eichmann trials. This is her book, yes. the Eichmann trials. Well, um, there, this has recently crossed my path, and it's brought up a kind of a question that's tickled upon in your book, um, that a lot of us inflict this cruelty to other animals, we ourselves being an animal, although that's not a term that, that, that we usually call ourselves animals, but uh, you also discuss that in the book. Um, But there's this thing about hierarchies that like if we work for a Cargill or Monsanto or we work for, uh, you know, a big food or animal processing pig slaughterhouse, um, we might just be the line worker. Our job is just to, to trim the beak off the chicken or our job is just to defeather that uh, one part of the animal uh, for eight to 12 hours a day. Um, but the true decision of high, the hierarchy of decision comes from the CEO, comes from the manager, the boss of, of the shift of that. And we, we've even gotten into this in 
a few other ways, like uh, I don't know if in, in Australia they have the county fairs and the 4-H clubs and these where children from the farm bring their animals and their sheep and their pigs and their, their pigeons and that in um, to prepare to prepare their animal to be sold for slaughter mm. or to be uh, uh, who has the fattest pig, who has the biggest turkey, things like that. And, and there, I don't know whether we, we want to call it the human condition. Are, are, why do we have the human condition to e even hurt another species, another human being, let alone in the Eichmann trials, which is, you know, obviously in Nazis in which you, you discuss there what what happened uh, or mentioned uh, that as well. But how can we do it to other animals in such a process? Um, is it because we've gotten into these wrong life models, business models, these hierarchy models? I mean, if you even if you look back at um, big history, uh, early antiquity, early Mesopotamia, Incas, Aztecs, Mayas, the ancient Greeks, they all had this hierarchy structure where the laborers and the slaves were at the bottom, the ones who were doing all the, the killing and the hard work and all the farming. But the true decisions were really, and the true force of the, what I almost would call evil, uh, is occurring way higher up in the chain. And, and so whether it's the human condition or hu humanist cruelty or, or however, I, I want to get your thoughts and feelings on that. And do you think there is some influence on how we've gotten into these horrific type of models of mass animal farming, mass factory farming and, and stuff that it's so disconnected from us? It's like, I, I don't even know that occurs. That's some, some, some worker doing that. Yes, but um, I don't entirely agree with your analysis. I do think that the fact that we've got these huge companies, um, you know, like Tyson's and Cargill and so on, that are producing these products does uh, mechanize it and vastly increases the scale so that, you know, we, we, we have, you know, Tyson's, I think, slaughters more than 40 million chickens a week. Um, so, you know, you just think of the scale at which that is, that is happening. Um, and that's going on in other countries around the world. We're talking about tens of billions of, of chickens and farm animals slaughtered each year worldwide. So, so the industrialization and the hierarchy has created that scale. But I think it's the applying of technology to the idea that animals are just things and that animals don't really count, that they're not part of us. They're not part of this sphere of ethics. Um, and that idea, unfortunately, goes back a long way further. Um, I describe it in animal liberation as speciesism. And I use that term to make the parallel with racism and sexism, which I'm sure most of your listeners and viewers would you know, say, look, I'm, I'm, I'm not a racist. I'm not a sexist. Um, but um, they need to ask themselves, am I a speciesist? Am I, do I think that because I'm a human, I have a moral status that is above that of all non-human animals, and I therefore have the right to use them as essentially as property. You know, they are legally property, not wild animals, but all domestic animals are, are legally property. They're owned by somebody. Um, and um, if I can make more profit from them by doing something to them, can I do that? Um, and that's, that's essentially what the factory farming is and what it does. Um, and, you know, the reason, well, one reason anyway, I think it goes back a long way further than this modern industrial age. Um, I, can, I can provide evidence for from a recent book that I edited that um, I think you, it's a good time to mention. Um, it's this book. Um, it's called that, The Golden yeah. Ass. Right, uh, you mentioned it in the introduction by Apuleius. So this is a book that was actually written in the second century uh, of the Common Era. So in the uh, under the Roman Empire, in the reign of emperors like uh, Marcus Aurelius um, and Hadrian at the beginning of his life, and I think Marcus Aurelius at the end. Um, 
it's fiction. Um, it's it's a novel, and a lot of people think you know the earliest novel is, I don't know, uh, Robinson Crusoe or the Tale of Genji or Don Quixote or something. This is you know a thousand years earlier than any of those, um, pretty much. Uh, and it's it's fascinates me both because I mean it's funny. You know, it's a great read. Uh, it's funny and it's you know got sexy bits in it that are entertaining, bawdy kind of tale. Um, but it's a story about a man who dabbles in magic and things go wrong and he gets turned into a donkey. That's what the golden ass is. This young man uh, who gets turned into a donkey. And then he tells the story in a first person narrative of what happens to him. And um, sure, some of the scenes, some of the bad things that happen to him are already hierarchy and domination. Uh, for example, he gets sold to a miller, uh, a flower miller, and he is harnessed to turn a stone, to turn the mill, the millstones, you know, the heavy millstones, and he's harnessed to that. And he has to do that for hours and hours a day, just walk around in a circle. And if he doesn't, he gets beaten. Um, and there are slaves who the miller also has, who, you know, help to make him work and carry things around and so on. So, so yes, it's a hierarchy with slaves and with animals. Um, and in a sense, that's also like an early industrialization of animals and the miller is the boss. But there are other scenes in, in this too, where, um, for example, there's, a, there's a, a boy who uses him to go and gather firewood on the hillside. And the boy just doesn't just, you know, load him up with firewood and take him back home. The boy is cruel to him. Um, the boy plays tricks on him. I mean, he beats him for one thing quite unnecessarily. Um, he beats him so much that he has an open sore where bleeding on the spot where he's beaten. But also um, he ties thorns to his tail so that when he tries to brush the flies away, the thorns prick him. Um, and in the end, he uh, passes a fire and, and uh, the donkey's carrying some straw and he throws a hot coal into the donkey's straw and the donkey would have been burned to death, except that there happened to be some water that he could throw himself into. So, you know, there's, there's randomized act, acts of cruelty as well as sort of industrialized cruelty going on. Um, and this is nearly 2000 years ago. Uh, so I think we have to accept that there is a, not in all of us, but, you know, there is a, a cruel streak in some humans and they take it out on those who are, inferior to them who they have power over you you could certainly say it's still a kind of domination but the point is you know the big bosses of the big companies they dominate the workers who they employ but the workers and others can get to dominate the animals too um, and and they do and they take out their feelings their anger maybe their sense that they're not the boss of everything um, on the animals so I think we have to accept that that's a part of human nature, of many people's nature, that we have to try and create the environment and the circumstances in which it doesn't really emerge. And in fact, the, the more benevolent and good-hearted forms of nature and the kindness that many people do want to feel towards animals that you can see every day looking online at videos of dogs and cats, for example, uh, we have to create the circumstances where that's what's going to affect not just the dogs and cats that we love, but all of the animals, including those we eat. I think that it's perfect and not only to talk about the golden ass and how that how that came up, but it really ties back again to, to animal liberation and, and to this whole discussion, because I think we can go a, a, a tick deeper in, in, into this as well. And, and you know, if I'm if, if I'm out of line, if I'm going too deep, or even maybe kind of reaching for straws, please let me know. And I'm glad that you said you, you know you're you're not sure you 100 percent agree on this hierarchy on the on the way that Hannah Arndt kind of lays it out there and kind of ties to to history. But it tied so nicely to this book. And now I, I'll, the way I want to go deeper is. <clears throat> And I, you know, and Hannah Arndt calls it the human condition, whether we call it that or we call it speciesism or humanists or, or how, however we, we look at it. Um, it it's more, uh, I've even heard say that, you know, are, are we closer to the bonobos or to the chimpanzees? That's maybe that aggressive trait, 
that comes out in humans that makes us a little bit more aggressive or, or, or cruel to one another or to other species. Um, I believe that it was much later, it was much, uh, much after your, your novel, uh, The Golden Ass, that uh, with Darwinism and Huxley mainly, where um, there, there was this kind of a shift it went from evolution to neoliberalism to neo-Darwinism, where, and, and I want to define it how, how, how I understand it, and, and maybe you have a different definition. Neoliberalism, neo-Darwinism means natural selection, only the strong survive, severe competition, um, comp competition and, and, you know, the the games and the fight and the Roman uh, gladiators. And, and really it's, it's uh, one will survive and the other won't. And, and it's, uh, it's, it's a different type of games that, that we see a different type of, of, of living. Um, that is something that just like the fossil fuel industry, just like many other things about food that we've been led to believe that that's the way our world works. Natural selection, only the strong survive, severe competition, and that's kind of the muster. But then came along Carl Sagan's first wife, Lynn Margulis, one of the ladies who turned the scientific community on its head. And she said, no, that's not really how it works. Neoliberalism, neo-Narwinism doesn't exist. That's not how our world functions. It's a symbiogenesis, symbiogenesis, a symbiotic Earth, a symbiotic planet, that um, everything in our world works in harmony together, in cooperation, in collaboration. One microorganism's waste is another one's food, and and that we have this um, symbiotic relationship with everything in our in our world, and really the birth of our Earth. Uh, really starts out with bacteria or this primordial soup. And if you realize what occurred in 2015, we discovered a whole new branch on the bacteria tree of life. And that whole new branch that we discovered lives inside our body. It's in our guts. And they're saying our gut is our second brain. It's these microorganisms and these cells and bacteria and even viruses are, are living in us uh, at any time. And that through this symbiotic relationship, we have more in common with an oak tree or a pig or a, a squirrel than we do with other homo sapiens, with other uh, homo genus uh, uh, relations. Um, and, and so where I'm going to, and I mean, here's, I told you I'm a big fan of books, but here's Lynn Margulis's books, uh, mm -hmm. uh, Symbiotic Planet and Microcosmos where she talks about it, she also wrote many books. And it's about this, um, this relationship with other species that we actually have a lot more in common than we think. And when our biome of our soil and these microorganisms and our relationship with other animals and species is in a type of harmony or a type of some symbiosis, that it's also a better model and one that is total opposite of hierarchy, total opposite of neoliberalism or neo-Darwinism. And there's, before I let you speak and kind of maybe speak to that, the last thing I would say, there's this old Sanskrit word and it's called seva. And it means in service to life and uh, or regeneration in service to life. And it has a lot to do with um, this, this, um, the symbiotic earth and, and you know where we see this hierarchy where man is at the top and woman's over here and all the other species and it's kind of very ego driven and then we see this ecological circle of the world where man and woman are in the center with other species and that's kind of more an ecological world but then we see this next evolution that's more like a heart it's it's a seva where uh man and woman, humans are, are equal with one another and all the species uh, are kind of in, in regeneration to service to life. 
And that that's a better model, not only for our food systems, but a, a better model for life to kind of get out of the things that, that Hannah Arndt talked about, to get out of the things that we're seeing in our food systems and, and, and in our world. And so I, I would like to know kind of how do you how do you view that? How do you see that uh, kind of distinction that maybe we just think we need to be cruel? We just think that, you know, we're bonobos or chimpanzees, but really our world doesn't work like that, never has. Well, um, let me go right back to the start because you started with, with Darwin and then went on to neo-Darwinists yeah. and neoliberals. Um, so this is not Darwin himself, right? Darwin yeah, does not yeah. say that no. um, always the stronger and more ruthless win. Um, Darwin does talk about those who are the fittest, but that's a very broad term. And Darwin himself was aware that that might come through cooperating with other members of your group, that um, maybe in, not only in human society, but in other uh, social animals, social mammals as well, um, in fact, you become fitter by being able to cooperate within your group and, and work together. And so there's nothing in Darwinism properly understood that says you should be ruthlessly competitive rather than that you should be cooperative uh, and take advantage of opportunities for mutual benefit, not just for your own narrowly selfish benefit. So I think that's that's an Im important point to understand that works against the, the neo-Darwinists who have that oper opposite interpretation of it. Um, but, you know, there was a point, I guess, where you went on where um, I'm not going to, uh, again, I'm not going to really go along with you fully. Um, I think we, you know, there, there are certainly, you know, I'm not disagreeing with Margolis that yes, of course, um, you know, everything is interwoven and uh, there are bacteria that are going to benefit from our bodies and uh, uh, and go off in other ways. And, and we have connections through that way with microorganisms and through that with plants and, and so on. But, but there clearly is a hierarchy in the sense that only our species has transformed the climate of the planet within a couple of hundred years in the way that we have. And only our species has built uh, weapons which, if all exploded, could end life on the planet. Uh, and only our species really has the, the, the intelligence and foresight to think about the future and to think about preventing these things that our own intelligence, but perhaps lack of foresight, have led us to construct. So. Um, you know, there is this, you know, while in one sense we're all interwoven, there's this other important sense in which uh, a lot of things really are up to us and we have to change the direction that we're going in. And um, that's not going to be simply accepting our equality with all microorganisms. Um, it is going to say, look, we, we're going to have to continue to feed this population that we have. And the growing population is another issue, of course, which we, we may need to think about. It's fortunately not growing as fast as it was growing in the 60s and 70s, but maybe, you know, it's still a, an environmental question. Um, so we have to think about feeding that population. We can do that, as we said, by cutting out or reducing the amount of animal products we consume. Uh, we should also, I think, and this is another area that I've worked on for many years, we should, we in the rich nations should be doing a lot more to help people in extreme poverty, to um, help them to live, but also to live better lives and to educate their children because educating children, especially girls, is the best way to slow uh, population growth so that girls can control their fertility and don't have to have lots of children because their husbands think that that makes them look like big men if they have lots of children so there are there are many things that we're going to have to do and i don't think we can do them without technology um we need that so it's a question of 
looking at the right ways of doing that. But also, and here I again will go back and agree with you, it also adopting a new ethical approach uh, that is a more, a more universal approach, uh, an approach that is global in the sense of thinking about people in poverty everywhere in the world, that is non-speciesist in thinking about other sentient beings on our planet, not just about members of our species. And it is also, you could say, um, impartial towards the future. We, we tend to take a short-term perspective. We focus very much on the present and near future. And that's one of the reasons why we haven't done nearly enough about climate change. But um, you know, now we're starting to see the effects of climate change on ourselves. If we'd been concerned about the well-being of our grandchildren, we would have taken much more drastic action 20 or 30 years ago when we first knew about what was happening. So, you know, those are all ways in which we need to have a, a broader, more global, more impartial, uh, less speciesist ethical approach. And then if we use our intelligence and our technologies and our abilities, uh, I think we can get to a, a better world that isn't imperiled like the one we're living on now is. Yeah, we, we definitely are in peril. Last week, the IPCC report came out and um, the, uh, I guess we're at a alert red and we've really got to act and, and, and quit debating and discussing. The last thing I want to touch upon in, in animal liberation before we go on to the life you can save and, and some other things, which also tie very nicely into this, is really... Um, and you may touch upon it in, in your re next revision that will come out or, or you may not, but I, I want to get your thoughts and feelings on this. And, and I'm going to, I'm going to pick on Australia. If you don't mind, I could actually pick on Brazil or I could pick on China, um, but I'm going to pick a little bit on Australia. And I want to talk about the true cost or the total environmental cost as percentage of EBITDA of, of food. And I, I, I wanna do it in, in a way um, to see about your thoughts and feelings on, on how this works. Australia produces a lot of animal agriculture for mainly other countries. I think the, the total percentage of, of, of meat produced in, in Australia is almost over 90% for other countries not even Australia. No, you could be right. I don't know the figures. We're certainly a big meat and, exporter. Yeah. And, and even if it, even, even if it was, even if it was less uh, or, you know, a, a more balanced uh, uh, thing, the, the point I want to get at is that meat, whether it's going to China, whether it's going to Europe, whether it's going to Africa, wherever that, that meat is going, has that product has been almost turned into a commodity because not the true cost and definitely not the total environmental cost of that meat that's being shipped somewhere else is being paid. And we're seeing it in climate change. So what's happening is, and excuse my language, basically is saying to other countries who are, who are purchasing this, this animal product from Australia, please come use our resources, let those animals shit and waste on, on our land and create methane and emissions and damage our waterways, damage our soils and, and, and that, because not all, not all of this animal agriculture is holistic management from Alan Savory or something that's regenerating the land or, 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 or giving back in a positive way, uh, a, a, a balanced return, so to say. It's actually at a, at a bigger cost than what it's being sold to. And then it's being shipped with carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions somewhere across the world and being sold at a fraction of what the true cost and the total environmental cost is. But those problems, that environmental cost is then left in Australia. The brush fires, the methane, the waterway pollution, uh, on and on is, is there. But also then we're, we're, we're wasting it because the true cost of labor, uh, water, um, packaging, shipping, that's not factored in to that meat that's being sold somewhere else. 
And, and so I, I want to get your, your views on that, how any country, and it happens actually more in Brazil and Argentina than it does in Australia, where they're deforesting land and they're, they're letting others basically shit on their land. And now their Australia's has to bear the brunt of that environmental cost because then the warming goes up, there's stronger brush fires, there's a ripple effect of climate change that happens because of those poor decisions that we make in, in animal agriculture, but in food in general all over the world. And so I, I want to um, see how, how you can tie that in because just a week ago, I heard one of the, um, I don't know if they call him a PM or one of the, the uh, politicians of, of um, Australia was, came out pretty strong against the United Nations Food Systems Summit, which is a big summit for the last two years about global food system reform, thinking more about the climate, thinking more about health and, and on to, to make a change, which is a kind of a step in the right direction. But there is also this big push on less meat, less consumption of meat, uh, moving away from meat. And he's also a, a lobbyist or representing somehow uh, the ranchers of, of Australia. And he was pretty upset and, and he was letting us know he was pretty upset. And so uh, I think there's a whole other side of the story that's not being told or that's never been addressed. And it's not just meat, it's in general, the true cost and total environmental cost of food has really never been addressed until just recently, a couple of years ago, we've started to really talk about the imbalance of it. And so I would like to get your views and your thoughts and how, how, how can we formulate that in our mind to, to deal with it better? Yeah, well, you're absolutely right. Um, the true cost of food is, is still not really being paid. Um, and you're right that when we produce meat here in Australia, we do suffer the environmental costs of it, including the, the, the bushfires that we have. But of course, we're not the only ones, actually. You know, the, the fires that are going on in the Western United States and have gone on in Canada, unprecedented temperatures in, in Canada, for example, um, you know, Australia's meat production contributes to that, um, just as Australia's uh, coal export, for that yeah. matter, uh, contributes to it as well. Um, but certainly, you know, and Brazil's meat production and meat production all around the world is contributing to that. Um, but, you know, our government is a conservative government that is supported by a predominantly rural party called the National Party. The National Party essentially represents the, uh, we call them graziers rather than ranchers here, but, uh, you know, the people who are raising cattle and sheep and uh, exporting them. Uh, and uh, so that's why they're sort of pushing back against this idea that we need to reduce meat, um, just as coal miners have been pushing against the, back against the idea that we need to cut uh, coal burning. Um, you know, we're starting to move a bit more on that, but uh, for political reasons, I would say, uh, the Australian government or this present Australian government is not likely to, you know, be sympathetic to ideas to call for a cutback on the meat industry because uh, that's where a lot of their seats in parliament come from. So, you know, it, for the moment, we're, we're stuck with that. Um, I think things will eventually change. More of the population is already in the urban and suburban areas and that'll no doubt increase. But... Uh, but well, we're going to need to see some uh, reaction from the markets as well. Uh, ultimately, you know, we need to we need to, to to get the markets to change, and that's where this idea of the true cost of food can really come in. Um, I was just reading recently uh, about something that's happening in the Netherlands, where a supermarket has actually opened up in Amsterdam that displays the true cost of the products. So, you know, you can you can buy this product if it's if it's meat for let's say, I don't know, $5 a pound or a kilo or whatever. Um, but then you see an extra thing that says, and the uh, amount of damage that is done to the environment in terms of contributing to climate change, or the, um, in some cases, it might be the violation of the rights of the workers, the exploitation of the workers, or it might be the denial of indigenous people from access to their land. 
Um, these we estimate, of course, it has to be an estimate at so many dollars. So the real cost is this many more dollars or euros, I guess it's going to be in Amsterdam. Uh, and um, then they invite people to pay that real cost. And if the people do pay the real cost, the supermarket will contribute those elements to organizations that are fighting for uh, reduction of climate change, for exploited workers, for indigenous people, and so on. Um, and at least, you know, I mean, clearly not every supermarket is going to do that and not everybody's going to pay that, but at least it's a way of educating people about the true cost of food. And um, I've been talking to some people who are developing a, a small shopping center here in Melbourne and, and they're interested in the idea of having a shop doing that. So I, I hope that that idea spreads around the world, that people can really see what the true cost of these foods are. And then they'll see that uh, meat in particular has a much higher true cost than um, it would have, you know, just the supermarket cost. Whereas, you know, other things like uh, plant-based foods, grains and beans and vegetables and so on, will not have uh, a significantly higher um, true cost than the cost that they're paying. My, my uh, thoughts and feelings have always been if you turn food into a commodity or if you che cheapen food, you, you're basically cheapening life. Um, uh, it's, it's the basic of all our needs. And, and there, uh, the reason I re really appreciate you going into that, but there was a pinnacle book that just came out. I only have it in digital version. Otherwise, I would hold it up. But it's called The True Cost Accounting for Food balancing the scale just came out uh, <clears throat> not even two months ago from Earthscan from Rutledge, um, Rutledge Studies in Food Society and Environment. And it's pinnacle. It's a very big read. It's probably biblical in proportion. It's kind of a workbook. But, um, you know, the there's many greats who write in there, but it's it's something that we've tickled upon before in reports, but now we have a, a pinnacle scientific uh, book and report out uh, or big work out on, on that. So I would recommend that to the listeners, but I also believe it's in full alignment to what you just said on, on true costs. You also said earlier in our discussion that if um, the amount of meat that we produce a year, we would need something like three or four planets worth of resources in order to do that, which is just obviously not sustainable. But that thinking of three or four planets worth of resources in order to produce meat or to have enough resources um, to sustain human life, that actually is something that's much older, comes um, from um, the global hectare, which is the ecological footprint, you know, how many, if we all lived like Americans, we'd need five planets worth of resources. Well, we don't have five planets worth, or like Germans, we'd need three planets worth of resources, which is that that way of thinking is not only true cost accounting, but it's this um, planetary boundaries living It's this global hectare um, ecological footprint living, whereas uh, Earth Overshoot Day was July 29th this year. That's the day that we went beyond the finite resources of our planet. We're kind of operating in a deficit. Um, I live in Germany, and Germany Overshoot Day was Cinco de Mayo, so May 5th. Four months and five days into the year in Germany, it already shot past uh, the, its resources to sustain itself and was operating in a deficit. Um, I, 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 I just got um, a contribution to my book, Menu B, from, from the Green Shake, and he said that in his contribution that Saudi Arabia contribute or purchases 90% of all its agriculture and food outside of Saudi Arabia to ship it in. They can't even produce it to themselves. So I believe their ecological footprint is even less. Um, and, and that's why I think it's important that we start living within the safe operating spaces of our planetary boundaries. We understand that the reason we have this Earth Overshoot Day means that we have, because it was July 29th, uh, just a, a little bit ago, means that we have 1.6 global hectares per person 
which is replicable, which means that if we had good stewardship over that, if we each had our 1.6 global hectares and, and we were good stewards of that, that we could live a ripe old age till 80, 90, 100 years of age, because that would provide us with enough water, food, resources, security, and shelter to sustain that life. But per person, we're at an overshoot. We're using 2.98 global hectares per person. And that's why we're in that deficit. That's why we're in that earth overshoot. And so everything that I talk about is food, everything that you know, you're know, you talking about ethics and food and animal liberation, but there's so, so many ties. If we can have that knowledge to understand that, if we can connect the dots, I almost think it empowers us to, sh to shift the model of how we live on, on how we choose. Do we choose to go into a hierarchy structure of how we live our life or do we try to work more in harmony with, with, with life and that? And um, you can see I'm wearing the sustainable development goal pin here. I'm an advocate for the UN. I, 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 I do a lot around food. You have this book, The Life You Can Save, and the organization and what you've done, but that has a lot to do with eliminating poverty, stopping hum hunger, and, and really changing the way charities work, how we think about the models of our life and, and, and what we can truly do, and, and the ripple effect that it can have to save and change the world. And um, so I think this is a good as time of any to really to touch upon that. And, and I will put the links and, and tell people as well how they can download these books for free, get, even get the audio version for free or listen to them on podcast. But I would like to hear a little bit more um, how, how you moved in that direction. You've been doing it for a while. Now you've given as a charity, as philanthropy, this out to raise awareness on what we can do. Tell us a yeah. little bit more about that and how that can shift your perspective. And, and change. So this is also something that goes back a very long way with me, in fact, to that same period when I was a graduate student at Oxford, and then uh, I became a junior lecturer, I stayed at Oxford for to teach for a couple of years. Um, so in 1971, uh pakistan consisted of two separate pieces of land one in the west where pakistan is now and the other in the east which is now bangladesh um and the people of what was then east pakistan uh wanted more autonomy they voted for a political party in a democratic election that would give them more autonomy the pakistani army wouldn't tolerate that they crushed it and as a result, 9 million people fled across the border into what was into then India, into uh, Indian part of Bengal. Um, so that was a huge crisis. India was a much poorer nation then than it is today. And it suddenly had to feed and house and provide sanitation for 9 million extra people. Uh, and it, it asked for help, but not enough help was forthcoming. And that led me to think, well, here am I. I wasn't, certainly wasn't wealthy then. I was living on a very modest salary. I think I just started being a junior lecturer um, and my wife was a high school teacher. Um, but we had enough. We were reasonably comfortable and we could afford to go across the channel to travel in Europe and our summer holidays and so on. And meanwhile, there are these 9 million people uh, you know, in danger of starving in, in tents on, across the border of, you know, of from where they where their homes were so we thought well you know maybe we should be doing something about this and how much should we be doing and how can we argue that people in our situation really shouldn't just be throwing a few coins in a tin when it's rattled under their nose but they should make some serious pledge maybe you know we started off with the idea maybe if everybody were to give 10 percent of their income we could really not only solve this immediate problem but we could solve some of the longer term problems about poverty so I published an article called Famine, Affluence and Morality, um, which uh, you know, was really uh, evoked quite an echo in the time. It got taught in a lot of college courses. It was reprinted in many anthologies um, and a lot of people talked about it. And so I you know, followed up that in various other ways. And eventually 
um, in 2009, a long time after, I wrote a book called The Life You Can Save. This is actually not that book. This is the second edition of the book, which was like the 10th anniversary edition came out just at the end of 2019. Um, and in that, I make the case for saying, if you really want to think of yourself as an ethical person, um, and if you're middle class in an affluent country, you know, whether here where I am in Australia, where you are in Germany, in the United States, uh, then you really ought to be doing something significant to help the, uh, you know, then it was over a billion. Now it's actually fallen a bit, but it's still something like maybe 800 million or 850 because of the pandemic, you know, to help those people who are in extreme poverty, which means they're below the World Bank's extreme poverty line, which roughly is two US dollars a day. Um, and that's all they've got to live on. So, you know, if, if you're spending hundreds of dollars or even thousands of dollars on a vacation, um, think about how much difference you can make to the lives of people who have only a few hundred dollars each year to, to live on and to feed themselves. Um, and, you know, so I, I did that. And then around, uh, a dozen years ago, maybe, uh, a, a younger group of people also starting in Oxford, as it happened, um, started thinking about, well, which are the, really the most effective ways to give? Do we know enough? You know, they accepted some of my argument, but they said, but, you know, Singer hasn't really done the research to say, which are the most effective charities we should give to? And uh, so they started out getting interested in that. A uh, couple of former hedge fund guys in uh, the United States started researching that, set up an organization called GiveWell. And now we have a whole movement um, called effective altruism that talks about how to be the most effective altruist, how to not only give away some of your money and do some good, but really make sure you're getting the best value for everything that you give. Um, and that kind of idea applied to global poverty is in uh, The Life You Can Save. It, it recommends some of these charities talks about them and it directs you to the website, thelifeyoucansave.org, where you can get the latest updated recommendations of you know, what is the research showing now as to where are the most effective charities. Plus, you don't have to pay for this, as you mentioned. Um, originally, it was published by Random House, but uh, this, the charity that I founded, The Life You Can Save, um, I gave the rights back to, to them or I gave it to them, bought them back from Random House. And uh, so you can download the ebook uh, absolutely free from the life you can save.org. If you prefer audio books, um, I asked some of my friends and uh, who are sympathetic and some celebrities to read chapters. So uh, Kristen Bell from the uh, uh, cable show, The Good Place, um, as well as Mike Schur, um, who's a producer uh, of it. Uh, they read chapters. Um, Stephen Fry, people who like the BBC and listen in to England will know Stephen Fry well. Um, and my favourite ever singer-songwriter, Paul Simon, um, also read a chapter, which is terrific. Um, plus, I read a chapter and there's uh, you hear an African accent, you hear Shabani Azmi, who's an Indian, um, reading. So there's a great range of English accents. Um, so uh, I, hope, I hope people will do that. And then, you know, we don't unfortunately have time to go into the full details of how we can best help people in extreme poverty, but, uh, but it's all there in the book. And, uh, and the best thing about it, I think, is so many people have told me that um, they actually feel better doing it. You know, it's, it's a little bit like what we're talking about with food. You eat the right diet, best for the planet, best for animals, and it so happens that it's best for you. Uh, but also with giving, you know, Yes, you have a little bit less money, but that makes much less difference to your life than the fact that you know that you're doing something really good, that you know that you're helping people who through just bad luck are so much worse off than you. And you know that the money is really going effectively to the people who need it. There, I mean, it, it, we really could talk for days because you are involved in so much. You've been doing this so long. There's one more thing that I kind of know about that you're going to have a book and, and you started these dialogues with a Buddhist female um, monastic um, 
discussing her approach to to ethics and things and i'd like to know a little bit more about that if you could kind of tease us and tell us what that is and what we can expect and and uh, so that we can be watching for it as well absolutely yes uh, it's been an interesting experience for me and it, this actually started through my connection with animals because i was invited to a conference in taiwan um, about treatment of animals uh, and i met her then she was the founder of an animal organization um, uh, but when you know we, we then traveled to another part of taiwan on the train and we were sitting next to each other and we talked about many things and i found her a fascinating person with a different perspective from mine but one that in many respects harmonized because she was also a vegetarian concerned about animals uh, also concerned about poverty um, she as a, as a woman she was a feminist uh, uh, as well you know the the buddhist rules for female monastics suggested that they had to be subservient to the male to the monks so when the dalai lama came to visit taiwan she and a few of her supporters uh put uh, wrote out on large piece of paper these rules that uh, suggest the females must be subordinate to the males they walked up on the stage with the dalai lama and in front of him they tore them up um so she's a person who's you know prepared to to be fairly dramatic not usually what you expect from you know a, we think of female monastics as nuns as very quiet people but some of them are real fighters so uh, we we had a fascinating dialogue then and she invited me back to taiwan to record a dialogue uh, and then we've been writing and elaborating for about five years um, but i hope that maybe next year it'll be out um, we're tentatively calling it a meeting of minds but we don't know whether that title is going to stick um, but i think for people interested in different perspectives east and west buddhist and secular utilitarian kind of ethic um, it should be a, a fascinating volume well i'm excited to see that i have um four last big questions for you um three or four of my listeners to kind of give them a sustainable takeaway things that they can use and apply in their lives um, be, there's been a plethora here already but the the next two are really um for you and a, and a bigger view of of um kind of how you see the world for, first and foremost during this crazy last two years there's been a lot of nationalism and division of humanity one from another um i've always from I'm, I'm originally from america i live in germany my mother's german i have family all over the world i kind of am this global citizen from birth on and, and always have been travel a lot but also have a lot of diversity in in, in my family and in those i associate with and do business do you feel like you're a global citizen and how would you feel about the removal of all borders walls and divisions limitations of humanity one from another but even more so the divisions that we build up with other species and other animals as well uh, i would love all of those divisions to disappear but i am a realist um i don't see that happening any time in my lifetime um you're younger than i am but i doubt it will happen in yours either i'm sorry to tell you um you know we are still we have these deep nationalist strains we we saw them you know, obviously in their worst form in, in in germany in the 30s and early 40s um but we've seen them again in the united states under donald trump it doesn't take very much to stir them up there um and uh you know, I don't see a government is going to be able is going to be willing to take down its borders. Um, even Angela Merkel, who I thought did a fantastic job in in assimilating the refugees from Syria, really, you know, had to eventually sort of say, we 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 can't just keep taking everybody. Um, so you know, and as for the barriers between species, that's something that I've argued about. As I say, the last fifty years or so, I I want to reduce those barriers. Um, I I would be amazed if they disappeared altogether in, in the foreseeable future. But uh, a kind of spirit towards animals is certainly within our, within our, the bounds of possibility. And I, I think we're starting to see some signs of that, but there's still a long way to go. 
This is probably the hardest question I have for you today. And I usually, I, I usually say it's the burning question, WTF. And most people think it's the swear word, but it's not. It's what's the futures. Um, but for you, I want to phrase it a little bit different. I would like to know in your view and your opinion and your plethora of knowledge, what does a world that works for everyone look like for you? Uh, it's a world with much less inequality in which people share a lot more and in which most importantly, their concern extends to all sentient beings. So um, they're not just thinking about how, can, how they can get an advantage nor even how their small group can get an advantage or perhaps even how their larger group can get an advantage, but they're thinking, they're taking into account the interests of all of those beings who have interests uh, who are affected by their actions. If there was one message you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? And even if it is two messages, what would it be? Yeah, well, well you know, Socrates uh, said in ancient Athens, uh, the unexamined life is not worth living. But few people really pause to examine their life. So I would ask your listeners to think about your life. Think about your real ultimate goals. Think about what you would like to be remembered for or what impact you would like to have made on the world as your life comes to an end, as it eventually will. Um, and I hope that in that examination of your life, you'll be inclined to want to contribute to making the world a better place, to do as much good as you can while you're here. I love that. That's beautiful. What should young innovators, uh, authors, writers, uh, um, great thinkers of our time in, in your field or doing what you have done over the years be thinking about um, when they're looking for ways to make a real impact, a big impact on, on our world? Well, I would like people in my field and other academic fields to really think about the impact that they're making on their students and on the world. Um, obviously helping their students to think clearly and to understand how to assess arguments and evidence so that they you know, don't go down these crazy rabbit holes of conspiracy theories from which they never emerge. Um, so that's a really important thing for people in my field to do, but also to try to keep relevant to the concerns of the world. Um, uh, while doing that. And I think that's really important. And the last one is really, what have you experienced or learned in this long journey so far that you would love to have known from the beginning, from the start? Uh, I would have loved to have known that uh, it is possible to make a difference, to have the confidence that you can make a difference to the world. There's so many people who I've seen who have done things that really matter that really make a positive difference and some of them from you know basically coming from nowhere without uh, a lot of wealth or education or background but um, through hard work and commitment they've changed the world peter thank you so much for letting us all inside of your ideas and opening your world and your work and and your uh what you teach to, to all of us and, and to really putting up with me and letting me go a little bit deeper, trying to get, get, get a, a little bit more insight because it has been a, a treasure trove. You have really opened up uh, to us all and, and given us a lot. I really thank you for that. Thank you so much for your time and, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Mac. It's been a pleasure talking to you. You really got me talking about a lot of different things and I've enjoyed that. And uh, so thanks for getting my views across to all of your listeners. We'll put all the links and, and descriptions uh, in the show notes and the descriptions and uh, all the social media so that everybody will know where to go to find all the things that we talked about uh, as well. Thank you so much. And you have a wonderful evening and, and get some good rest there, Peter. Bye-bye. Thanks, Mike. Bye. Thank you.